Okay, so thank you and welcome back. So, uh, yeah, let me just recall the <clears throat> what I plan to, to talk about. So yesterday I talked about the first part here concerning uh, Markov chains. And today I would like to cover parts two and three. So two is a first step uh, along generalization to stochastic differential equations via continuous space Markov chains. And uh, there will be an example that is uh, coming from neuroscience, uh, so which uh, will be the Fitzsimmons equation of noise. So let me just very briefly uh, recall uh, a couple of things I said yesterday. So I was interested in these uh, Markov chains. Uh, yesterday it was on a finite set, and they have this particularity of being very close to the identity. So all transition probabilities are very small. So uh, all states of the Markov chain are actually metastable states. Um, but the different uh, prob transition probabilities, uh, they're all small, but they can be very different. So that are these different powers of epsilon. And the aim was to be able to say something not only on this example, but on a very general uh, type of chain of this uh, kind, but with uh, many more states. And here was the, the main result, which said that uh, you actually have an algorithm that allows you to compute uh, to a good degree of precision the eigenvalues of this uh, transition matrix. And it goes the following way. So assume you can find one, uh, one uh, state which is much more stable than all other states in the sense that it's, uh, so it's less stable. So it is easier to leave this state than any other state. And in that case, you already get a good approximation of one of the eigenvalues of the Markov chain. So it would be close to one minus the probability of staying in that state. And uh, what you do then is that you, you just remove the state from the Markov chain. You compute a new transition matrix with one state less. Uh, and uh, this is called the trace process. So it's a process that only monitors the system when it, uh, it stays in this new smaller set, and then you just iterate the procedure. So that gives you an algorithm, which is actually uh, reasonably fast. So I think its complexity should be n to the three, if n is the number of states, something like that. And uh, you can reformulate the result in the following way. So if you're able to, uh, iterate this uh, procedure and always find one state which is less stable than the other states, then you get expressions for all eigenvalues and uh, they're given by, by this relation here. So the kth eigenvalue, if you just translate this uh, definition of trace process, it will be close to so one minus the kth eigenvalue will be close to this probability starting in uh, state number k plus one to hit uh, the states below in this uh, decomposition before returning to the state k plus one. And so in, in a way it gives you uh, not only an algorithm but also a way to, to handle this, uh, I mean, to, to, to give some probabilistic interpretation of, uh, of these sets in terms of transition times, which will be useful later on. And then I also said that you get uh, ways to approximate eigenvectors of the Markov chain, which will also be useful later on. All right, so today I want to uh, talk about stochastic differential equations and it will be via uh, continuous space generalization of these Markov chains. So let me first uh, remind you of a tool which is used uh, a lot in uh, the study of ODE. So let me assume I have an ordinary differential equation like that. So time derivative of, of Z, which is an Rn, is some function of Z. So let's assume that I have a well-defined flow for, for all positive times. And uh, what people often do is that they use some 
it can be a plane or a more general surface of co-dimension one, uh, which I'm going to call sigma. And uh, then what you do is that you start on, on this surface uh, at the point Z here, and then you, you follow the flow. So uh, that's, uh, that's the flow until it returns to the surface at the point, uh, which is this point T of Z here. And, and that defines a map T from, well, maybe a subset of sigma to, uh, to another subset of sigma by that is relation. And why is this useful? Well, there are many reasons. So one of them is just that you reuse dimensions. So uh, it is often easier to study the n minus one dimensional map than the n dimensional ODE. For instance, if n is three, uh, you get a two dimensional map, which is uh, quite easy to, to visualize on, on a computer. Maybe more importantly, uh, uh, a question like stability of periodic orbits, which are a bit easier to study in the sense that if, if you linearize around a periodic orbit, you will, okay, you will do Floquet theory, but you always have uh, this neutral di direction you have to get rid of somehow. And if you look at instead at the, at the map T, uh, you will automatically have uh, gotten rid of this direction. So it can simplify things uh, a bit. And also, if you want to classify bifurcations, so you know uh, periodic orbits, they can, uh, if if uh, the system depends on the parameter, you change the parameter, and they can change quite a lot. So uh, can have things like Hopf bifurcation, you can have period doubling bifurcations, and it's actually easier to study these on the level of iterated maps than on on the level of orbits. So uh, what we want to do now is. Uh, so uh, develop similar ideas for stochastic differential equations of the following form. So I'm adding here a uh, small parameter sigma times some uh, G, which could be a, a matrix times a Wiener process. So here's a picture for simplicity. I've drawn things in, in the plane, but it works the same in higher dimensions. So I have my stochastic differential equation. I assume I have a global solution. And uh, so you know that there's a notion of a sample path, which will depend on the initial condition, Z naught on time and on the realization of the process. And you can very nicely describe these things in the framework of uh, random dynamical systems that Maximilian has talked about. And what you would now like to do is say, assume I have here two periodic orbits. So gamma one, uh, let me do it like that. Gamma one, gamma two are two stable periodic orbits. In between, I will have uh, maybe an unstable orbit or something. And I have my, my section sigma here. So this is my, my section and I start somewhere in the point X naught on this section. And I, I would like actually to say something like that. So the image of X naught under my random Poincaré map will be the uh, position of the trajectory at the first return time to this section. Now, you uh, quickly realize that there's a little problem here because technically speaking, if you define the first return time like that because time is now continuous and the uh, Brownian motion is very irregular, the first time, the infimum of all positive times at which you are in sigma will actually be zero. So it doesn't do what, what you want. You will just uh, get the starting point. There are a number of ways to, uh, to remedy this problem. And one of them is simply to say, let's introduce a second section up here. And now let us require that we make an excursion. So I first define uh, time tau prime, tau prime uh, one say, which is the first time at which I hit my section sigma prime and then 
tau one will be the first time after tau one prime at which I return to sigma and then things are really well defined. You can do different things. You can work in some kind of polar coordinates and then just look at the angular part. So ask that the angular part increases by one or two pi or, or whatever. You will usually have some particular trajectories that do things which are hard to control like that. You could have a trajectory that just goes to the, to the center here and then things are not well defined, but uh, in good situation, these things have a small probability, so we don't really care. So this now defines uh, my, my random Poincaré map. So, so I have here my Xn, which will be the position at the nth return time to sigma to n. Mathematically speaking, it is a Markov chain with continuous space with a certain transition kernel. So K of XA will be probability starting at X that I return inside the set A. And you can also see that's again similar to what uh, Maximilian told us before. That is now a function of the starting point N of the nodes, N of the random nodes. So we use the term random Poincaré map, which is adapted from a paper by Pavel Hitchenko and Georgi Medvedev. Uh, they did quite similar things. I later found out that actually this concept was already studied uh, by Weiss and Knobloch in uh, 1990. So the question is now how to analyze uh, this, this Markov chain, which now lives on a continuous space, some subset of Rn typically. And let me step back a little bit and uh, restate things in a slightly more abstract way. So the situation I want to study now is the following. So I have a Markov chain on some state space, which is a part of d-dimensional space, say, with a certain kernel k sigma. So sigma here uh, will be a small parameter which describes the noise intensity. So when sigma is equal to zero, you have a deterministic system. And when sigma is positive, you have a random system. The definition of my kernel, I recall here. So by the Markov property, which in the case of, of my random Poincaré map follows from the strong Markov property for SDEs, tells me that I have a certain kernel k sigma of x dy giving me the transition probabilities. And if sigma is equal to zero, this uh, kernel should be actually something a bit degenerate, which is an indicator function associated with a deterministic map pi, which is the same as my Poincaré map in the deterministic case from before. So this is also used in dynamical systems. So I think this one is a Koopman operator. There's a transfer operator and a Koopman operator. They're kind of dual one to, a, to another. So uh, I always forget, I think this one is called Koopman operator. Now for positive noise, what we want is that this kernel actually admits a continuous density. And then there are conditions of uh, the type ellipticity conditions on the noise term, which ensure just that. So, so that is not much to ask. Now, two examples uh, of, of this particular solution. There's actually a very simple example, which would be a randomly perturbed map. So which will just mean that you, you take your deterministic map, capital to pi, you iterate this map, but at each iteration, you add uh, a copy of uh, so identically distributed random variables with a given density. And uh, for instance, you could uh, take Gaussian variables, but you don't have to. And you put a small parameter sigma in front. So, so that would be one example fitting in this framework. And the other example is what I just told before. It's this random Poincaré map defined by a stochastic differential equation with a surface of section, and you look at these returns. 
you can probably imagine other situations, but these are the ones I, I have in mind today. Now, let me give you a number of assumptions which will allow us to work with similar ideas as what I told you about in the case of Markov chains. We did at this point not really try to optimize these assumptions, so they're probably far too strong. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can weaken many of these assumptions, but these give you a nice framework in which you, you can work with these things. So there are going to be five assumptions and I'm going to give uh, some details on them before giving a general result. So the first assumption concerns the deterministic dynamics. So my deterministic map capital Pi should admit a positively invariant compact set X naught. So this just means that uh, X naught is uh, mapped into itself and it is the, uh, the analog of in continuous time you, you often have situations like this where you have the flow of your dynamical system pointing inward some, uh, some domain here some set X naught. So that's a fairly uh, typical assumption you do for these kind of systems. But uh, we're going to assume more. So whenever you have such a positively invariant compact set, you know that the, uh, the orbits or the, the iterates of any point on the map pi will have accumulation points, which are called omega limit sets. And we don't want them to be too complicated. So for simplicity, we are going to assume that all limit sets uh, well, first of all, there are finitely many of them. They are all hyperbolic fixed points, and capital N of these are stable. So you can have here uh, so hyperbolic fixed points. They, they could have stable and unstable manifolds, or they can be completely stable or completely unstable. You can have uh, foci as well. But what I don't want is to have some uh, strange attractors in there, which of course exist for these kinds of systems. It's probably not very hard to generalize things to situations with periodic orbits instead of, of fixed points. That's uh, actually kind of, of trivial. But uh, we don't want to have a too complicated li limiting dynamics. So next, we want to have a way of controlling the effect of noise and there's a convenient framework for that which is called the theory of large deviations which some of you might know if you don't know it it is sufficient at this point to uh, to know the following things so it it gives you the probability of So probabilities like that. So K sigma of X A is the probability if you start at point X for the positive sigma to arrive in a set A. And there are two cases, either A contains the, the deterministic image of, of X and then it's actually very likely to have that. Or uh, A does not contain the deterministic image, and then it will be exponentially unlikely. And the probability is given by exponential of this minus the infimum of a certain weight function over the set A divided by sigma squared. And so because in the deterministic case, it's not unlikely to, to land in A, we want to, to, to well, we will have this relation i of x y is equal to zero if uh, y is pi of x, but we uh, we want to this to be an if and only if. Now this is not a strong assumption in the two examples that I mentioned, because in the first example, which was the randomly perturbed map. It's very easy if you take a reasonable noise to, to show that you have this uh, large devi deviation principle. 
And in the SDE case, that's exactly what the large deviation theory developed by Freilin and Wenzel gives you. So, so you know you have uh, this weight function i, and you have ex rather explicit expressions for it. Now, the next two assumptions are going to be about, uh, they're going to ensure that, uh, in particular that I have an invariant measure. So the first one is a general generalization of what you have for Markov chains on countable spaces, because for a Markov chain on a countable space to have an invariant measure, what you need is a positive recurrence. So meaning that starting at any point, the expected return time to this point will be finite. That will not work in any reasonable case for continuous space Markov chains. So you will replace it by positive Harris recurrence, which is essentially equivalent to saying that the hitting, the expected hitting time of any set of positive Lebesgue measure is uh, finite. So the idea is that you cannot expect to hit particular points, but you can hit neighborhoods of points. And to, to prove uh, such a relation, there are actually many uh, well-developed methods. So, so there, there's a rather general method which uh, has been developed by mine and Treaty which is based on uh, so-called Lyapunov functions. And in this uh, context, the Lyapunov function, it will be a function V that goes from my state state X to R plus. And it should be norm-like, meaning that it grows to infinity as X goes to infinity. And uh, it should satisfy a certain uh, condition of, so there, there are variants on, on this condition, but one way of writing it is that k sigma v of x should be smaller equal to gamma v of x plus some constant d, where gamma is between zero and one. So gamma is kind of contraction constant. And so that's sometimes called a geometric drift condition. And if you have that, you can prove uh, that you have positive Harris recounts. Actually, the book, mine and Trudy have written a book, but which is not easy to read because it assumes very little on the K. It doesn't assume that uh, you have a density, for instance. So what I recommend, uh, what is much nicer, there's a really a uh, very nice paper by Martin Heirer and uh, Jonathan Mattingly. Uh, the title is something like Yet Another Proof of uh, Harris uh, Criterion for uh, becomes Criterion for Markov Chains or something like that. So, so that uh, if you're interested in this kind of systems should really be on your reading list because it's an extremely clear proof of uh, why this condition gives you uh, Harris recurrence. And, and there's another paper by a certain Garrett Birkhoff, who I believe is the son of the George Birkhoff, who's well known in ergodic theory. And he used a slightly different approach, but which is also very useful. And actually, many of our results are based on Birkhoff's approach. So I, I put the references in the slides, which I will send the organizers so you will have them there. So these two conditions are actually quite easy to prove using these methods. I mean, this uh, positive Harris recurrence is, is easy to prove for the two examples I've given before, uh, if you have some reasonable structure on, on the system. And so there, there's a, so what this, condition does is that it guarantees that your the mass of your probability measure will not go to infinity. It's like for, you know, that random walks on, on ZD are not positive recurrent. And the problem is that simply they, they can drift away to infinity. So you need something confined. The other thing you need is something 
that uh, ensures that, that your system will not live on two small subsets. So it's a type of minor variation condition. And, uh, so what we ask for here is, is called uniform positivity by, by Garrett Burkhoff. And it's, if you wish, a kind of Dublin type condition. And what it says is that, uh, let us assume for, for the moment that K, uh, forget the N and the I here, just assume that K of XY is the density of your Markov kernel. Then what this asks is that this kernel does not depend too much on the starting point. So the way of writing this is that given a certain point to y, the ratio between uh, I mean this ratio between the soup and the inf of k of x y over all x should be bounded above. So what we ask here is actually uh, less restrictive because we don't ask this uh, to be true for any x and y. We only ask it to be true for so the, the extra i here are the stable fixed points of my deterministic map capital pi. And we put small balls bi around these points. And somehow this condition only has to hold when the point y is in one of these balls. And actually it does not have to hold for the kernel k. It has to hold for the kernel, which is a trace process. So it's a kernel where you we only look at the at the trace on uh, a union of neighborhoods, and so it looks a bit complicated, but it's actually less restrictive, and we have a way of proving this under reasonable conditions, which are uh, okay. Actually, for the random Poincaré map situation, what you assume is. Uh, so, so we have a coupling argument and you use a Harnack inequality, which uh, is known for uh, the first exit density. So it's a bit technical, but we can prove it for the two examples I've given before. All right, so I need one more condition, which is this non-degeneracy condition. And let me uh, spell it out in the uh, SDE case specifically. So I talked about this weight function, this large deviation principle. And for my SDE, my stochastic differential equation with drift term f and uh, diffusion coefficient g, the Freidlin Wenzel large deviation principle gives you the, the following expression of. The weight function. So if G is identity, it's just the integral of the norm squared of, so gamma is your trajectory, gamma dot minus F of gamma. So you see it's zero if and only if gamma is a solution of the deterministic equation, otherwise it's positive. And, and then you have this large deviation principle saying that the probability that your system will uh, be in a certain subset in path space will go like exponential minus the infimum of the weight function over sigma squared. So the weight function can be seen as the, the cost in terms of probabilities to follow a particular trajectory, which is different from what the deterministic system would do. Now, there's a notion of quasi potential in, uh, in this business. So, which will be in our case, so ij are just the numbers of my stable periodic orbits. So, if gamma i, gamma j are stable periodic orbits, I look at all paths that go from orbit gamma i to orbit gamma j, which are continuous paths. And I look at the, at the weight function of these paths, and I let the, the time in which you, you follow this path be arbitrary. So you take the infimum over all positive times. And that gives me a number, which is called the quasi-potential between the orbits. And then I have a condition which 
written like that looks a little bit uh, hard to process, but I'm going to show you what happens in the picture. So in the picture, I'm going to assume that actually my, my quasi potential is a potential, meaning that there's some global potential such, uh, so that would be this function, let me call it V, uh, such that the, uh, the, such that H of IJ would be V of uh, X star I minus V of X star J, something like that. That is not in general the case. It would be the case in reversible situations, but in general, it's not the case, but it just helps uh, understanding what, what happens. So, so in that case, it means, so if I have, uh, what does it mean? So if I have I and J two orbits here, then H of IJ would be this height, that would be H of IJ. Okay, and if I have uh, another orbit K, here, uh, h of i k would be uh, would be this height here. That would be uh, h of i k. So now, what I I do to satisfy this condition. So what this condition basically says is that all heights are, are different and they are suitably uh, far from each other. So let me just erase this part. So what I do is that I, I look at each uh, stable periodic orbit and I, I look at how high I have to go to escape this potential ray. So here it's this height, here it's this height, here it's this height, and here it's uh, this height here. So I, I look at how high I have to go to exit a particular value. And, and then I look what is the smallest height of all of them. And in this case, it is the leftmost here. So this one will be my, uh, there are five local minima, so that one will get the number five. And now I, I start again, but I, I, forget, I forget this one. So the next one will be this one. So that one is four. And then again, I, uh, uh, no, sorry, I have only four, so let me, so that, that was four and that was three. Okay, now I erase this one and what I see here, so uh, now I have actually to, to update the heights here because uh, the, the basins of four and three no longer count. So I have to, to update the heights here. So I update it like this and like that. And now I see that the, the next one will, will be this one here. So, so that will be two and that will be one. Okay, so you can see that uh, this what the condition says is that between the different heights uh, above one, two, three, four, there will always be a sudden difference. That, that is actually very closely connected to what I did yesterday for Markov chains because these different heights are actually, uh, they give you uh, escape possibilities. And just a small remark, I can actually replace this, uh, the assumption three was positive Harry's recurrence. I can uh, at least in part weaken it by assuming that, so if, if I want to, to work on a, on a compact set, I can always condition the system on staying in this compact set and then use dupes H transform to get a Markov process in that set and then uh, work in, in a similar way. And if I do that, I, I need a certain condition on, on the quasi potential, which is written here. But this is not very important for, for what comes next. It was just a small remark. All right, so under these conditions, here is uh, the main result. And it's actually quite similar to what I did for Markov chains. So let's assume I have these 
n uh, local minimum, uh, these n stable points here. And I have ordered them in this particular way, which I just uh, kind of explained on, on an example. And then I, I know that I have capital N eigenvalues, which will be exponentially close to one. So these are the eigenvalues of my Markov kernel. As always, uh, I have the eigenvalue one because of Perron Frobenius. And the next N minus one eigenvalues are well approximated in times of some, some kind of committer function. So as before, I start somewhere around the orbit number k plus one, and I look at the probability of fitting any of any neighborhood of an orbit below in the hierarchy before returning to this orbit. The one thing which changes here is that I don't start in a specific point. I don't start in the orbit. I start in the small ball in a certain probability distribution, which is uh, actually a quasi-stationary distribution of, of a certain process. But it's usually you can, you can get bounds by starting just in a point. And the other thing which is new is that I, actually my Markov kernel will have infinitely many eigenvalues. So it's a standard compact operator. So you will have an infinite sequence of, of eigenvalues uh, accumulating at zero. So what you can say is that all subsequent eigenvalues are smaller. So you can't really say that you have a spectral gap of order one, but it's of order one over log sigma, which is very large compared to this, these probabilities, because remember these probabilities, they behave like exponential minus h of, okay, that would be k plus one and uh, the set of all orbits of from one to k over sigma squared. So, so these probabilities are exponentially small. In addition, you have some uh, information on eigenfunctions, which I'm not going to delve into here. And one thing I didn't say yesterday, which was already true there, but which is useful here as well, is that you also have this estimate on expected transition times. So if you start anywhere in the neighborhood of the K plus first, uh, so periodic orbit, stable periodic orbit, the expected first hitting time of the union of neighborhoods of the orbits below will be close to one over one minus lambda k. And, and this behaves like exponential plus this uh, quasi potential over sigma squared. So here we assume this metastable hierarchy. So uh, the system has to be non degenerate, but you can also look at the generate cases and we don't have a general result there, but uh, that's kind of a method to, to analyze that. And I'm not going to say more on the proof of that, uh, except that many steps are actually already in what I did yesterday. The main thing that needs to be done in addition is to obtain a spectral gap estimate for, for these uh, processes, which are uh, trace processes on neighborhoods of orbit. So, so there's a part which is technical, which is non-trivial, which is the spectral gap estimate, but you can do it with these met methods by uh, Garrett Burkhoff I, I mentioned before. So that part is a bit technical, but apart from that, it's really the same approach as for Markov chains. All right, so now let me illustrate this method in an example. So it's not Strictly speaking, an, uh, exactly an illustration because uh, I have to adapt the framework a little bit, but never mind. So, the stochastic Fitzhugh Nagumo equations are equations from neuroscience. So, you have two real variables, x and y. So, x is uh, representing the, the membrane potential of a neuron, so the potential difference between a uh, inside and outside the, the axon of, of the neuron. Uh, y 
is uh, recovery variable, you can view it as a proportion of open ion channels in the membrane. So it's a simplified model of more realistic equations such as Hodgkin Huxley. And you have this not so complicated uh, two variable system, which is a bit similar to the Van der Kolle oscillator, if you know that. In this talk, I'm going to assume that B is equal to zero for just for simplicity. And in that case, so, so this term is not there. And you see that there, there's actually only one fixed point, which is given by X equals A. And, and then you have a certain, uh, and then yeah, you have Y which will be equal to a cubed minus a. So you have one fixed point, you can linearize around it. And you find that uh, the stability and the type of, uh, of uh, behavior you have around this, uh, this fixed point is the function of this parameter 3a squared minus one over two. So depending on the sign of delta, it will be stable or unstable. So here's a particular situation where epsilon is a time scale separation. It's uh, relatively small. Delta is small as well. Uh, delta has been chosen in such a way that my, my point, so my fixed point, which is here, is stable, but just barely stable. So what happens is that so the, the black curves I, I've drawn here are the null clines. So these are the curves where the, the drift is zero. So one of, so the cubic here is, uh, has equation y is x to the three minus x. And the dotted, uh, the dotted line here is x equals a. And they separate the plane in four regions where, so uh, what happens is that uh, at the left of, x equals a, uh, y increases, at the right it decreases, and depending on whether you're above or below the cubic, uh, the, the other variables, so x will increase or decrease. So you have a dynamics like that, and the wet solution here, the wet curve is just a particular solution that goes through, through this point here, and it kind of separates behaviors where you make a big excursion and behavior where you, you don't make a big excursion. And then what we want to do is to add noise to the system. So I add independent Wiener processes to my variables X and Y. The square root of epsilon I put here is for scaling reasons. It is there to match this one over epsilon here. And if I do that, here is a, is a sample path, it's a particular solution. So you see what it does is, so I started from here. So it more or less follows the deterministic dynamics. It goes to this barely stable point here. It makes a few oscillations and then it takes off again. And then it goes back and things repeat. So such a system is called excitable because it is uh, susceptible to very small uh, excitations. Now here are a few time series where uh, in the different simulations, I changed the, the noise parameter here. And you see that when you increase the noise level, these excursions, which are uh, allowed to, to model to represent spikes, so that's what neurons do, they have these spikes in the membrane potential, you go from a situation where the spikes here are, are very rare to situations where they are almost uh, uh, periodic. And that's the kind of thing you want to describe. And you can also see that the shape of the spikes is almost the same all the time, but in between you have these, these phases with small oscillations and the oscillations themselves are are not regular at all. So you really have small and large oscillations and the number of oscillations is, is random. So that's what we want to describe. And the way of doing that is to introduce a 
random Poincaré map. So P here represents my, my fixed point. Sigma, I, I took the null line as, a, so, so now I'm in dimension two, so my surface of section is actually a line. And actually any line from any half line starting in P will, will do. Now, since I, what I, I would like to describe is the, the small os oscillations here. So it makes sense to say that I will look at my system only uh, as long as it stays in, uh, in some set D, which I've shown here. And I declare that whenever I leave this set D, I have a spike. So I'm interested in the behavior between spikes. So uh, I will kill my Markov chain whenever it, it leaves the set D. So what happens is I start somewhere up here so, and then I, I intersect the surface of or the line of section sigma first time at point Y not. Then I make one rotation, I intersect it at Y1 and then I leave and then I kill my, my chain. And I'm interested in the number of small oscillations here, which is a random variable. So a first result is the following. So, uh, so that's the result I obtained with uh, Damien Landon a, a while ago. So this random variable is actually asymptotically geometric. That's a term uh, that is due, I think, to uh, Pavel Ichenko and Georgi Medvedev. So meaning that you have the following limit here. So for geometric random variable, the probability that capital N, which is the, the survival time is equal to N plus one, given it's larger than N would be equal to a constant. Now let's say my variable is asymptotically geometric if the limit here, uh, so, so I, I converge to a certain constant in the limit. And this constant is actually the principal eigenvalue of my kernel. So meaning it's the, it's the Perron Frobenius largest eigenvalue of the kernel. And it's strictly smaller than one if there's noise in the system. So I can give a, a few ideas on, on how you obtain that. So the, the main, the main observation is uh, the following. So K of X, Y, actually, if, if I call, so lambda I, the, the eigenvalues, phi I, pi I, the, the eigenfunction. So I have a decomposition like this. So lambda naught is the principal eigenvalue and phi, phi naught, pi naught are the associated uh, right and left eigenfunctions. So I, I have this, which is a projector on the, the zeroth eigenspace with coefficient lambda naught. And then I have a similar term with the first eigenvalue and, and so on. And if now I I take uh, the nth power of this. I just take the nth powers here of the, of the eigenvalues. And now what I have to compute is this conditional probability. So let me first compute the probability if I uh, start with a certain measure, I don't have to write it, that I survive at least up to time n. So that's the same as the probability that at time n, uh, I think this one was called y. So at time n, I am in sigma. And that would be the integral over sigma of, okay, mu, mu naught is my starting measure, would be a point, okay, n of x sigma. And now I, I use this decomposition here. So Kn of x sigma, that's just the uh, integral of uh, lowercase kn of xy, y integrated over sigma. So that will be given by the integral of lambda naught phi naught of x times, so the integral of pi naught over sigma is just one. And then 
this has to be made precise, but the idea is that I get the remainder, which goes like lambda one to the n over lambda naught to the n. And in this thing here, that I can write as lambda naught to the n times the inner product of mu naught and phi naught, which is just a constant. Now, if I have a spectral gap, uh, result, this thing will go to zero if n goes to infinity. Then I can make a very similar computation for the probability that n is equal to lowercase n plus one. And by very similar arguments, I will get lambda naught to the n times one minus lambda naught. So I, I see my geometric distribution there, times this times a similar error term. So lambda one to the n over lambda naught to the n. And now I, I just take the ratio of these two things and let n go to infinity and I've got my result. So let's just look at a few simulations. Uh, here we have varied the uh, parameter delta, which is the bifurcation parameter and uh, plotted histograms of distribution of the number of small oscillations. And you see that uh, you have a really nice fitting of this geometric decay uh, over very different orders of magnitude. So in the first case, you have thousands of small oscillations. In the last case, you typically just have one or two. So, so that fits. The, the theorem pretty well. Of course, the theorem is only on the asymptotics and the asymptotic decay is exponential. Now, uh, let me uh, give a second result, which is more quantitative. So what it says is that if epsilon is sufficiently small, n delta is sufficiently small compared to square root epsilon, which is a condition that comes from the stability analysis. So uh, delta is delta is to be smaller than square root of epsilon for the fixed point to be a focus. That's where the square root epsilon comes from. So then we can actually uh, have a more quantitative estimate on the principal eigenvalue. So it will be exponentially close to one with an exponent depending on sigma and uh, epsilon and delta provided sigma is small enough. And uh, as a consequence of that, the number of small oscillations will have an exponentially large expectation. So let me just give you a hint of how you prove such a result. So if I take A to be a su subset of sigma, let me write the eigenvalue equation so that's the uh, version which is integrated over A of the equation telling that pi, pi naught is an eigen function, with eigenvalue lambda naught. So it, it would be this. Now, this I can bound below because Perron Frobenius tells me that pi naught is real and positive just by restricting the domain of integration. And, and that I can bound below by pi naught of A. So that's uh, L infinity L1 bound and infimum X in A, K of X in. So provided I can show that, that this is uh, different from zero, say uh, it's positive, so that you have to show, but it's not very difficult. I get this lower bound on lambda naught. So lambda naught will be larger than the infimum X and A, K of X A. And, and K of X A is the probability if I start at X that I return to A. So to, to get a good lower bound on lambda naught, I want to find a set A such that if I start in A, I'm very likely to remain in A. And this probability will give me a bound on the, on the eigenvalue. And 
so so that's the general idea and then there's a technical part where okay uh, my, my student damien suffered a lot doing that but but that's that's what you do when you do a phd so we use methods from uh, you know from dynamical systems to simplify uh, i mean to make changes of coordinates so to, to get uh, an expression of the dynamics, which is easier to work with. So first we translated coordinates to the Hopf point. We did a scaling of space and time, and then we made a nonlinear transformation uh, that will straighten the, the null climb, so which is a locally like a parabola. And then uh, the, that is well known, I mean, that goes back to, I think, Ernö in the uh, 80s or 90s, you, you get a system like that. And if you forget the, the orange terms, you can understand what happens because you have a fixed point when Z is one half, which is up here, and uh, a certain dynamic. So you have Xi on the abscissa Z on the ordinates. So we have a fixed point here. And, uh, and Z equals zero will be invariant if this parameter mu is zero and mu uh, it's a small parameter depending on delta and, and epsilon. Now, if you add noise, so you get a lot of extra terms here. And in particular, that uh, that will also change here the this drift, this mu. And uh, this change here, uh, that's uh, Anito Sratonovich. Uh, uh, correction. So it means that because there's some nonlinearity, you will actually change this uh, drift coefficient when you add noise. And then the idea, you can see it on, on the picture here, is that this term, if this mutilled is large enough, will give a, an upward drift. And if it's large enough, and large enough means that somehow it has to be larger than the noise intensity, then it will be likely, you will be likely to go up. And, and that will give you your set A. So your set A will be a set which will look like this. So you, so what you want to say is that if I start a bit above the, the axis, I will be likely to come back here. And, and that gives this condition here on the parameters if I transform back and that gives me uh, the result. And actually you can even obtain some more uh, qualitative information, which is not a, a theorem, but uh, nevertheless, uh, if you linearize the previous equation around z equals zero, you obtain this kind of similar to an einstein ullenbeck process. And you can actually estimate this probability of, uh, so it's the probability of, of going down here. So you can estimate that. Uh, but okay, you will get the distribution function of the normal law because uh, the solution of the process involves a normal law. And uh, numerically, it fits very nicely. So the blue curve is is this uh, is this curve here, and and the stars are the probability to uh, to exit immediately. And uh, okay, the, the, the other symbols are, are a bit off. They are estimates of the principal eigenvalue and of the, the estimated number of, of small oscillations. So just to, to wrap up, and I, I'll finish in, in, in a minute. If you put all this together, you get these different regimes here. So my main theorem here applied to regime one. So that was, it's the regime down here. And in that regime, I know that spikes are exponentially rare. So, uh, so I, I have the picture here and I have uh, estimates on uh, how, how unlikely the spikes are. And then I get two more regimes. So, uh, and, and these regimes, uh, okay, I, I won't discuss this in detail here, but they, they really, they come by looking at this formula, which is not a theorem, but which is an approximation and, and numerically works pretty well. So you just look at when the argument here is positive or negative, and that gives you two more regimes here. So one where 
actually your the probability of spiking is is neither very small nor very close to one and then you get the, these clusters of spikes and regime three when you're up here and it's very likely to spike immediately and, and you have this third regime here so uh, i think that was all i wanted to say today so here are just a few references uh, which I, uh, I will send the slides to the organizers anyway. So these articles here are research articles on what I told uh, yesterday and today. Uh, these are the, the references I mentioned on, uh, uh, on, on, on this, uh, how to prove Harris recurrence and, and these, uh, uh, these, uh, these ergodicity estimates. And there's also a chapter in these lecture notes I wrote last summer that gives more details on, the, on this convergence to the invariant distribution. So I think I'll stop here. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh...